Here we go. Good morning and welcome to Hibernation Fascination. Um, I'm Melissa Yaple and thanks for joining us today. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to let you know what we have coming down the pipeline later this month. We have a ton of fun webinars planned for you. Um, tomorrow, we are going to continue celebrating Black History Month um, as we explore the Underground Railroad on ODNR lands. There are reminders of the journeys that these brave men and women who traveled the Underground Railroad um, throughout our state parks and forests. You can find reminders on those properties. So we're going to explore those tomorrow. Uh, then on, excuse me, that's not tomorrow. That's actually February 9th. <laughs> I'm getting a little ahead of myself. February 9th at 10 a.m. Um, and then it, on February 10th, we will uh, explore African American history in Ohio's Little Smokies, um, which is in Southern Ohio. So there were um, some all black CCC, Civilian Conservation Corps camps, and they built roads and bridges and trails, and some of those are now our Ohio State Parks and Forests. So we will learn from Dr. Andrew Fate about those on February 10th. Then on the 17th, we have um, a webinar on bobcats in Ohio, and February 23rd, we'll be learning more about the CCC in Ohio, but not just in Southern Ohio, more around the state um, as well. And on the 24th, we have maple syrup production with um, actually Catherine Connor, who I'm going to introduce now. She's going to be one of our presenters today. Hey, Catherine. Um, and then I'm going to, Catherine will be back in just a minute, but we also have with us Jenny Richards. And Jenny is going to be kicking off our presentation today. There's Jenny. Hey, Jenny. And before we get started, if you have any questions, just so you know, please go ahead and um, put those in the Q&A box and we will be more than happy to answer. I have Jenna Winters in the background here helping out, so we will be monitoring your questions. But go ahead, Jenny, you can take it away. Uh-oh. You're you're good, Jenny. Let's I see. see. Oh, you got to go back to the... Yeah, I have to go back a few slides. Sorry about that. You can just hit your left arrow on your... Okay, there we go. There go. All right, so thank you for being here with us today, and we're excited to share with you some of the wonders of winter slumber. So we're going to talk about hibernation, and who knows what is hibernation? Anybody know what hibernation is? It's a state of inactivity and metabolic depression in animals characterized by lower body temperature and slower breathing and lower metabolic, met, metabolic rate. And basically, it's just a way that animals conserve energy, especially during winter months. Although some animals, even in hot weather, will hibernate. And it's called estivation. Why do animals hibernate? To escape the cold. To preserve energy when, when food is scarce. And to adapt to changing climates and landscapes. Now there are several different varieties or types of hibernation. Um, and I want to share that with you because it's a really a big topic, hibernation, and, and, and different animals do it in different ways. So we'll start with brumation. And brumation is a state or condition of sluggishness or inactivity, especially in reptiles and amphibians during winter or extended periods of low temperature. Next is diapause. And diapause is a, a period of suspended development in an insect or other invertebrate, especially during unfavorable environmental conditions. So this is for insects. And then we have torpor. And torpor is basically just 
the varying types of hibernation. So a state of lowered physi physiological activity, activity typically characterized by reduced metabolism, heart rate, respiration, and body temperature that occurs in varying degrees in hibernating animals. So we'll start with brumation. We said that it occurs in cold-blooded animals, and here in Shawnee we have the amazing and rare timber rattlesnake, which goes down into hibernation underneath of a rock crevice or an old tip up, which is like when a tree, a giant tree falls over and the root wad tips up in the air. It pr provides this huge open corridor underground where animals can take take refuge from the cold. And timber rattlers are special because they go to the same den and year after year after year, it's called their ancestral den. So the young follow a scent trail to the den that their mother actually, the scent trail their mother left behind. So that's really interesting. Eastern hognose, of course, I had to put a picture of the beautiful Eastern hognose. Um, and one of the reasons is you can see that this is a, a snake by the tip of the nose that looks like a little shovel. This is a snake that kind of likes to dig around in dirt and sand anyway, but they go down underground below the frost line in the winter to stay safe from the cold. Now, even though they're cold blooded, they go down below the frost line and they're still absorbing water from the soil and they're, they're not completely um, knocked out. This is kind of a light form of hibernation, torpor is or brumation. Fence lizards also hibernate or brumate. And this little fence lizard in the picture with the nose with water on it is actually licking water off of my nose. I had the sweetest little fence lizard in captivity in the nature center for four years. And lizards don't normally drink out of a pool of water. They drink water off of a blade of grass or something like that. And I just had to show that picture because I sprayed water with a spray bottle on my nose and let the fence lizard drink it off my nose. It was really cool. One of my favorite days at work. The Eastern box turtle is a wonderful, beautiful animal that's, you know, lives across across the state and they dig down underneath the frost line as well and they burrow for the winter and then they reemerge back in the spring. Now, some salamanders actually thrive in winter months. I don't know if you've ever heard of a mud puppy, but it's one of the larger salamanders and they're completely aquatic. Although they have lungs and they do go up to gulp air, um, but they have these big red feathery gills that just float around and get dissolved oxygen out of the water. And these are most active between the months of November and March. And you can even see them walking around under ice. Now they're not able to freeze and thaw like some amphibians, but they do like cold weather and they thrive in that cold weather. They're becoming very rare across the state though. So sometimes fishermen accidentally catch them and it's really important that we put them back in the water. This is a really interesting one of the mole salamanders and mole salamanders live down in burrows deep in the earth anyway, so they're safe from frost, although this one, the marbled salamander, does a really cool, um, she has a cool way of laying her eggs to get a, a jump start on all the other uh, mole salamander eggs, which lay their eggs in vernal pools before most other salamanders come out. So she lays her eggs in the fall in a shallow depression, which we call a vernal pool because they usually only have water in them in the spring, and then they dry up in the summer. Well, in the fall, they refill and into the winter. So she goes and hides under a log, lays her eggs, and that's a female guarding her eggs. And then as soon as the vernal pool fills back with water again, she'll go back down into her burrow to stay safe from freezing temperatures. But some amphibians, they can actually freeze and thaw. They just get down under the leaf litter. They freeze solid. Um, everything ceases to, to work in a wood frog. It's also the case for a few other varieties of Ohio frogs, and that's the tree frogs. 
um, the copes gray and the gray tree frog, as well as the smaller tree frogs like the chorus frogs and the spring peeper, they can actually freeze and thaw. Their liver makes um, sugars start happening and this really complicated thing keeps their cells from piercing each other. It's really amazing. You can learn lots more about it if you're interested, but an animal that can freeze and thaw, and it won't be long, February Valentine's Day is usually when the wood frogs start to cluck in the vernal pools here in southeastern Ohio. We can start hearing them on Valentine's Day. Now we'll talk a little bit about diapause, which occurs in insects. So with metamorphosis, we have all these different stages, you know, in moths and, and um, also in butterflies, and most of the moths will overwinter in a pupa. So they'll, you know, the caterpillar will turn to a moth and it lays eggs and it develops, well, the caterpillar turns into the pupa, and then it'll fall down on the forest floor and just lay there on the leaf litter. And some of them look like other things, and some of them smell like something, then an ant will carry them away. There's really cool, um, stories that go with these, but they overwinter in this form, most of them, not all of them. I'll tell you some more cool stories, but um, that keeps them good until the next spring when they can hatch out and the caterpillar will start, you know, gobbling on leaves when there's leaves available. Now, the mantis is a really cool animal, but we won't see praying mantises alive walking around in the wintertime. Instead, we'll see this really cool egg case out in meadows. If you don't mow your meadow in the winter, you let it grow up. All the um, insects, uh, this is actually called an uthika, uthika, um, or othika, it's hard to pronounce the egg case there. And one time I made the mistake of cutting one of these and bringing it inside and all these baby praying mantises hatched all over in my office. And it was cool, but the problem was there wasn't food there for them. So make sure if you find one of these cool egg cases that you leave it where it is because uh, you don't want to you know, damage the, the praying mantis babies. And now this is a Carolina mantis here. We have a few varieties of mantids that are actually not native, but we can tell this is a native one by the dark spot on the uh, forewing of the, the female there and the male has it. Other insects do other things like damselflies and dragonflies. They lay their eggs in the water and then the nymphs live in the water throughout the winter um, and then they emerge in the spring when there's insects flying around to eat because that's what they like to eat. This is the coolest story, the morning cloak, early, early spring when the first spring wildflowers are emerging, you can see these amazing butterflies flying when there are no other butterflies about. Maybe, maybe a, a couple early spring butterflies, but the reason is this butterfly actually overwinters as a butterfly, which is really amazing. They must just hide underneath of the bark of trees and under leaves and they wait till the first warm weather and then you'll see morning cloaks flying around and they are so beautiful with that yellow out outer edge and the blue marks all along the back. And then I guess if um, if uh, diapause isn't for you, then you might be as cool as a monarch and just migrate and fly all the way south to the Yucatan Peninsula. Although some don't make it all the way there. Some some will um, go down to Texas and South Florida and things like that. But so, you know, animals have all these amazing ways of surviving uh, cold weather. Next, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about torpor. And torpor is basically just hibernation, but it's varying degrees of hibernation. So I started with the ruby-throated hummingbird because Many birds will actually, even at night in the spring and summer, will just slow their body down, you know, slow their metabolism, slow their breathing, and they will just sleep for the night. 
reserving their energy resources. So they'll their little feet lock up on a branch and they find a safe place and they just go to sleep for maybe just a, just a night or even just a couple hours. Ruby-throated humming, hummingbirds might just take a little two hour slow down in order to conserve energy. And so as we go through the next slides, I'm going to start with things that do like small amounts of, of torpor and go into the ones that go into deep hibernation. So in the winter time around here, it's nothing to see a red fox out running around in the snow and enjoying the winter. They have nice thick fur and, and they seem to really enjoy hunting in the snow and staying active all year long. Many of the rodents, I've seen uh, mice running across the road in, in the middle of winter. So many of the rodents will stay active in the winter too when it, on warm days they're they're active so the the fox can find plenty to eat out there in the winter although it will den up some you know when it gets really cold at night the fox will go into a log a hollow log or down under some um, debris and it will it will den just like the bobcat which i got to see a bobcat last night on my way home from work i think it was the same one that i saw a month ago and i got a video of it and it was running across the road and then it stopped down in a creek and ran the rest of the way up the hill it was so exciting and i had my daughter um there with me because i picked her up on my way home and and she got to see it too so she thought that was just so cool but bobcats, they can tolerate the cold pretty well and they're pretty active year round, but they do still do some denning. The skunk, soon it will be mating season for skunks and we'll be seeing skunks all around crossing the roads, but they also will den and, and have a little bit of torpor throughout the winter months. Just like the raccoon. How many babies can you see in this picture on the top right? It's hard to see them all, but you can see, I think there's four babies in that image, baby raccoons, and I just think those little fellers are so cute. And possums also den or go into torpor, but you can see them waddling around out in the winter cold sometimes too, but when it gets really cold, they, they take a rest. And then we get a little deeper into hibernation with the smaller the animal, the longer usually the hibernation and the deeper the hibernation has to be because their, their bodies have a high surface area um, to volume ratio. So it's harder for them to withstand long spells of cold weather. So bats will typically do a, a long hibernation and pretty much stay asleep and they wiggle around a little bit during their hibernation and, and things like that, but they're not out looking around for food and they usually start in October and go all the way into April and they, they hibernate in abandoned mines and caves and little cracks and crevices and rocks and sometimes in attics, which people really freak out about normally. And then some of the bats actually migrate. They go south where there's still insects flying around. And those are the bats that are doing really well because they don't hang out together in the winter. So they're kind of separated in individuals and they're, they're doing really well. Chipmunks go into a, um, another sort of hibernation as well, but chipmunks wake up several times throughout the winter and even though their heartbeat goes from 350 per minute to four beats per minute, they wake up periodically to eat. They store a bunch of food down in their little den with them and they eat and they potty and then they go back to sleep for a while and they wake up and they eat and they potty and they go back to sleep. So these are all varying forms of torpor. This is what animal most people think of, I think, when they think of hibernation. They think of the black bear, but the black bear does not go into a deep, deep hibernation, a deep sleep. You can rouse a black bear when if you were to go into a place where there was a sleeping black bear for the winter, you could you could rouse it up. It, it would wake up. But they do sleep a long time. They go into hibernation for a very long time. They do not eat or drink and they do not potty. They're just there in a dormant state, lowering their body temperature and all that. But the interesting thing about the American black bear is they actually have their young in hibernation and their young is just tiny little feller, about a half a pound. And so the, the babies will nurse and, and grow considerably over the hibernation period and come out as little bear cubs. 
So black bears do hibernate, but there is only one or two, I could say two, two true hibernators in Ohio that go into a really, really deep sleep. And the one that we all know and celebrated a very special day yesterday um, was, I know you know the answer, the groundhog. The groundhog goes into such a deep, deep sleep that you could dig one out of the burrow and you could toss it around like a football and it would not wake up. It would just sleep. And um, I was mentioning there was one more and that's the 13 lined ground squirrel, which is like a little prairie dog basically. And they're, they have a really spotty distribution in Ohio. Um, but the, the true hibernators in Ohio really do go into deep sleep. And the body temperature of a groundhog drops from around 99 degrees to 37 degrees. The heart rate goes from about 80 beats per minute to five beats per minute. The breathing slows to about 16 breaths to as few as two breaths per minute, which is really amazing. Um, they don't lose very much weight either while they're down there. They're so deeply sleeping that they don't lose any more than a fourth of their body weight. And they are able with their very large incisors, they have bottom and top and they grow and grow and grow, but they're able to chew through roots and everything. And they'll chew a burrow down into the earth about six feet deep and maybe have extensive tunnels like 20 feet of tunnels that they hide down in there because they really do need to be hidden well. And they stay safe because when they're sleeping, they're not making any noise. They're not, they don't have an odor at that time. They're just deeply sleeping. And, um, you know, they, they can stay safe from predators that way. Now, yesterday for Groundhog Day, I hear we had a little conflict and that Puxatawney Phil says we're going to have six more weeks of winter but Buckeye Chuck says that it's going to be an early spring. So I wonder who do you think made the proper prediction? Who do you think made the prediction? Is everybody still there? Oh, we're, we're here. Um, we do have a couple questions that came in. Um, Dan asked, what species hibernates for the longest period each season? Probably the, the woodchuck. But bats, bats hibernate a long, long time too. It just depends on the region where the animal is and, you know, what but the year has to hold for us. Animals have amazing bioindicators. I was reading, there's so many cool facts. The wood frog females that are older that come out in Febu early February, the older females come out first because they have a larger egg mass. So the ones that freeze, there's still some in the middle that will survive. So that keeps the genetic diversity going, that salamanders have the ability to know when a vernal pool is actually drying up and they can increase their metamorphosis and make it happen faster. Animals have this amazing ability to sense the environment and know what's going to happen next and adapt to that. It's just amazing how they can survive all these different things that get thrown at them. So I, I think probably bats or they, they stay in there a long time. October to April is a long time, isn't it? But groundhogs also go down early and they I think I read 150 days for a groundhog. Yeah. That is a lot. We had um we had some answers come in and it looks like so far who's a who's replied agrees that Buckeye Chuck would be the correct predictor. Um, I we hope did have so. One. <laughs> I hope so, yeah. Um we did have one other question that I, I figured I'll ask you now if that's okay. Um, is it dangerous to wake up an animal that is hibernating? Dangerous for who? The animal or for you? It depends. They didn't, they didn't specify, but um, I guess... I'll, I'll answer both. Yes, okay. if you wake up a sleeping bear, that would not be a good idea, especially if there was a cub in there. wouldn't be good for you or the bear. Also, it is very... Um, 
it's not a good thing to disturb animals that are in hibernation, especially bats. Um, they're there to conserve their energy so that they can survive this long dormant period, you know, where they're not getting fed or watered or anything like that. So if we disturb that, they have to expend energy in order to, you know, get settled back in. So we always want to make sure that we're very respectful of anything that we find asleep in the winter if you're exploring in a cave. Yesterday I found a little cave in the Shawnee Forest. It was so cool, a little recess cave I'd never seen before. And I was looking everywhere. There was a big long crevice and I was had this hibernation in my mind anyway. So I was thinking, I wonder if a bat could squeeze through those little tiny crevices to actually hibernate. And if there are bears hibernating in Ohio, where do they go? You know, how do they find a, a cave big enough? Well. I heard Pat Quackenbush told me that a few years back, a bear was actually found at Rock, Rock House, sleeping in Rock House. So we may find an animal trying to get some winter sleep. And if we do, we want to make sure that we're just quietly back away and let it do its thing. Fun fact, it's the International Year of the Caves and Karsts, and we're going to be celebrating um, that later in March. So if anybody's interested in caves. Um, <laughs> we also have Parker and Porter, age 11. Thanks for joining us again, Parker and Porter. Um, they asked, what's your favorite hibernation animal? And then I'll let you get back to your presentation, Jenny. I, my, my part oh. is done. I think okay. we get to go to see some live animals with Miss Catherine. And my favorite hibernating animal, Oh my goodness, that's just hard to say. I, I really am a fan of bats. Um, and it's probably because I always go for the underdog. You know, people are afraid of bats. They're afraid of snakes, afraid of spiders. So I tend to, to fall in love with those little critters that most people are afraid of so that I can share that uh, love for those kind of animals. Um, but I, I do have to say that it is really cool that Ohio, that we have in the United States, one of our birds hibernates. And I think that is really, really neat. I don't know if you've ever heard a whippoorwill or a Chuckwill's widow, which returned back to Ohio in the uh, spring, but their cousin, the poor will, which lives out west, actually hibernates. And it's the only bird that I know of that hibernates. And I think that's a really cool thing. Awesome. What about you, Catherine? What's your favorite? Oh, I'm trying to send you live and it's not. Well, that's not okay. Me. I have to, uh, hi, I have to kind of go with Jenny here. I am a lover of the bats. Um, it is so amazing to see the species, the number of species we have here in Ohio, which is about 11. And yes, yeah, some of them migrate, but some of them here, you know, find those little crevices and those big caves. And it is amazing to get to see those little critters. So. I have to say bats. That being said, I do love groundhogs too. Oh no, I showed something too soon. Hi guys, I'm Catherine. I am from Houston Woods State Park and Jenny kind of gave me a really great introduction. Today I am going to go over some of our live animals. If you've never been to Houston Woods State Park, that is something we're kind of known for. Uh, you're welcome to visit our nature center. Our outdoor displays are open every day from 10 a.m. to 4.30. Our inside is closed right now, but the inside is part of the fun, so I was able to bring that to you today. And we're going to talk about some reptiles, um, also one of my favorites. But they don't really go into a true hibernation like Jenny mentioned. They are brewmaters, and each species brewmates for a different reason. So I will start off with a snake. Snakes are one of my favorite, and this is a milk snake. And eastern milk snake is a very common species that you can see here in Ohio. They can be found in forested areas, grasslands. They're also one of those species that you might just see in your backyard or in your garage or small spaces like that. In fact, milk snakes got their name because of people seeing them in and around their barns. Um, a lot of times farmers would think those older cows that just weren't producing as much milk anymore were being sucked dry by snakes. Snakes don't drink milk, but what they do is eat rodents and rodents are plentiful in and around barns. So milk snakes got a little bit of a misidentified name, but they're still a pretty interesting snake. You'll know you've got a milk snake in your hands or 
around you by a couple things. So their coloration is really beautiful. So if you can see here, their colors on their scales, they've got these little dark spots. And these dark spots are outlined in black. They've got black circles around them. And that comes into play when you're trying to identify them versus some of our other species. A lot of times these can be misidentified for water snakes as well as copperheads. Now they will not have that dark coloration around their spots. The other thing that definitely says milk snake is the top of their head. And she just wants to look right at the camera. The top of their head has a little Y pattern. And that Y is just kind of the start of their spots. And it signifies to me that we've got a milk snake. Now, when you're talking about snakes, the reason they have to go into that brumation stage is because all reptiles are cold blooded. That's one of their common characteristics. Now we are warm blooded and being warm blooded means that we have kind of a temperature that we need to keep at. You know, we can check our temperature and it should be right around the same number. With snakes and turtles and other reptiles, they are going to have body temperatures of varying degrees depending on their environment around them. But that being said, when they do eat that food, so if this milk snake were to catch a mouse or insects are good food for these guys, amphibians even. They'll constrict that food, they'll eat it, but the way they digest it is going to actually be by using their body. And if their body's not warm enough, they can't digest that food. So when we get those colder temperatures, what they need to do is find an area that they can burrow down deep into and lay dormant. They're still going to be awake. They're going to be able to come out on really nice, warm, sunny days that a true hibernator would not do. They will stay in that dormant stage. Whereas these guys, if the temperatures are right, they'll come out, bask on a rock and enjoy a beautiful winter day. But this is not the only reptile I have here with me today. So this was our milk snake. One last close up look at her there. She loves to show off. And you'll notice she's sticking that tongue out, smelling around. This is her first time in front of the camera. So she's very curious as to what's going on. But she is not our only reptile that I brought with me today. One of my favorite. Uh-oh. Looks like Catherine may be frozen. So actually uh in the meantime jenny oh. um oh catherine are you back my snake turned off my internet <laughs> so sorry about that guys she just wasn't done talking to you so she got a little about it let's move <laughs> on to our turtle our turtle here is one that you're probably not used to seeing as much and she'll get a little bit more comfortable as the day goes on but this is a musk turtle, also known as the stink pot. One of the good reasons we're just doing cameras today because she is smelly. So east, uh, common musk turtles are also a common turtle that you can see in our waterways and our ponds and lakes. And that's typically where you're gonna see these guys is basking around um, ponds, lakes, up on the rocks. Because remember, cold blooded, they love to sit out in the sunshine but they are a species that tend to be a little bit more skittish. And so they will go ahead and just dive right back into the water before people even get to see them. And this is an adult, so she's not gonna get very much bigger than this, but she could if she wanted to. A couple things signify to me that she is an aquatic turtle. One is her streamlined shell. She's got a very smooth, sleek shell. If you had a terrestrial or a land turtle, they're gonna have a much more domed shell to them. And then the other thing, and she's not showing it off very well, is she has little webbed claws in there. And those webbed feet help push her along the bottom of the pond, bottom of that water. Push, but also webbed fingers help her swim. And this type of turtle is very closely related to the snapping turtle. So if you were to see her come out of her shell, hopefully she will soon, what's gonna happen is she's got a very long neck. So she can grab and get all those good insects in the water. She can also do minnows and small fish. Uh, these are actually a turtle that people sometimes accidentally get on their fishing hooks. And it is one, remember stink pot, smelly, two, related to snapping turtles, meaning they don't have as well of a protective shell 
as some of our other turtles. So you'll see, even though she's hiding in her shell, a lot of her body is still exposed. That's the same way with snapping turtles. And so they tend to be a little bit more aggressive uh, just because they need to protect themselves. So even though she is small, she definitely has a snappy little bite. But the way turtles will survive the winter is very similar to snakes. They're going to burrow down deep. But what's great about aquatic turtles is aquatic turtles burrow and bury themselves in the bottom of those lakes and ponds. They'll actually bury themselves down deep into that mucky mud and stay there. They just slow down and the lake can freeze over, ponds can freeze over, and they're doing just fine. And the thing is, they don't freeze like we think of our frogs or our fish, uh, particularly our amphibians doing. But with these guys, what they do is they basically transition their entire way of living. So if this turtle was buried down deep in the mud, how are they going to get uh, air to breathe? How are they going to get oxygen? They can't breathe through their mouth. So something that is uh, pretty neat about a turtle is the turtle, you've always maybe been told that you can't take a turtle out of its shell, and that is 100% true. The shell is basically a turtle's rib cage. It's part of their vertebrates. Everything about them is the shell. So in that shell and in their mouth and in some other parts, they've got these blood vessels that are very close to their skin. And that's really important because when you're down deep and you can't breathe out of your mouth, you gotta find somewhere else to breathe out of. And if this is her head and she can't breathe out of there, she's got to find the other spot to breathe out of. One of my favorite animal facts is that turtles can breathe out of their butts. Um, and for you guys out there who have seen Frozen 2, Frozen 2 stole my fun fact. I even had visitors come up and say, Catherine, Catherine, Frozen 2 said turtles breathe out of their you know what's. And I said, thank you, Frozen 2, for backing me up. They knew I was telling the truth. But the reason that they can do that is the blood vessels around that area allow them to absorb that oxygen. So we know how they're getting oxygen into their body, but how are they eating? If they're still alive and awake down there sometimes, how are they eating? So they're not going to be taking in food from their mouth anymore. What they're going to be doing is actually eating some of the stuff that they have stored in their body. So what they do is they basically switch their metabolism from being aerobic, which is very active, to an anaerobic metabolism. It's called, uh, what is it, Anaero anaerobic reproduction. And what it means is instead of needing oxygen, they're going to use glucose, so some sugary substances in their body. Unfortunately, though, that sugary substance is not always really good for them. So remember that really important shell I talked about? This shell not only is their ribs, but the way it's comprised is very much like a scaffold, so a nice building structure. And what that shell does is it will collect all that lactic acid. And what it will do is it sends out a substance to neutralize it and basically cut out that lactic acid. And so basically a turtle not only can breathe out of its butt, but can make its own tums. So anybody out there with uh, acid reflex, like some people, I might also have that. Turtles can do that all by themselves. Don't I wish I could do that a little bit better. So our turtles, I guess, honestly, I really do like bats, but these might be my favorite. Turtles are amazing creatures, and a lot of times you see them out in the wild and you don't think about everything it takes for this little guy to survive. So our aquatic turtles, are amazing brumaters. They just basically switch their whole lifestyle around and then when it warms back up, they come back up and they go back to <sighs> breathing like everybody else. They can't breathe that way during the uh, summer months because it's just too hot. So that's only during the cold months when they will be doing that type of work. So one last look here at our common musk turtle. Sorry she didn't come out. Must be camera shy today. But I do have a few more animals with me today. And it'll be just a second while I bring them out. And we're moving away from our brumation to another way that animals will survive the winter. We're going to talk about a species that migrates. So 
Jenny, I have a quick question for you. Um, will bats hibernate in bat houses? Do you know? Will they hibernate in bat houses? Yeah. Catherine says no. Oh. No, so bat houses don't actually get to be the temperature that bats need. What bats will do with bat houses, and I only know this because I've been diving really into bat houses, uh, as we put up some new ones in the park this past fall. They use those when they first come out of hibernation, like Jenny talked about, or come back from their migratory journey. They use them as a resting stop and even a place to help with their young. So they could, you know, kind of bring up their babies in that safe environment of the bat house. So they're still very important, just not active in the winter time. That was an awesome question. <laughs> so everybody, somebody who does not stick around for the winter time is a peregrine falcon. Peregrine falcons are a bird that aren't really common in Ohio, but they can be seen in Ohio. So peregrine falcons are typically a species that you see along our coastlines. They really like those large cliff faces and those high, basically high peaks. And that's because these birds are just that bird eaters. They are big, fast diving birds, so they need that high space. In Ohio, we don't really have those large cliff faces they need, but we do have skyscrapers. And those large buildings and big cities, basically what they've adapted to have that lifestyle still. So a lot of times peregrine falcons can be seen in uh, Columbus and Cincinnati and kind of Cleveland, those bigger, larger cities. And I mentioned they're bird eaters. That's something I like to talk about because it is awesome how they catch their food. So hopefully you guys out there know or are learning right now that peregrine falcons are the fastest land animal we have. They can reach speeds of over 200 miles per hour when they come from that cliff face and dive down towards their food. But they are going so fast that they can't actually catch their food in the air. So a bird that's flying, along, they can't just grab it. What they have to do is stun it first. So as that peregrine falcon is flying deep, deep, faster and faster, it closes up its talons and punches the bird. So they will punch the bird right out of the air. And when that bird stuns itself, it will grab it and can safely return it to where they can go ahead and eat their food. So falcons are primarily bird eaters. And Problem is though, they are very temperature sensitive. So usually uh, peregrine falcons won't do well in any temperature below freezing. I believe they say about 20 degrees, but we keep it safe. And if it's below freezing, she gets to stay inside. But what they do out in the wild is peregrine falcons will migrate. They will actually migrate to South America where it's much warmer, much, much warmer. But what's very interesting is so in peregrine falcons, as it is February and the month of love. Let's talk about when it comes time to lay those eggs. Peregrine falcons are monogamous, so they are going to have the same male and female together their entire lives to lay eggs and to be together, except when it is time to migrate. Uh, it was really neat. It was the Division of Wildlife who had a falcon cam, and they ended up being able to get those falcons and to put some uh, Oh, what it is, GPS trackers and banned them. And what they realized over this period of time that they researched these falcons is it wasn't a fluke. This happened every year. Their peregrine falcons would fly down to South America and the one would fly to the eastern part of South America and the other would go to the western part. So we always like to joke that basically they come together to have their young, but vacation separately. They'll come together back up here when it is time to lay their eggs. But for some people, staying in Ohio is just not for them. Peregrine falcons like Freya here, though, are a really interesting bird to get to see. I'll show off her wings a little bit there for you. She is with us for a very important reason. She can't go back into the wild because she broke her collarbone. Uh, and with that broken collarbone, it means that she cannot fly very well anymore. Uh, she really can't fly at all. And so she wouldn't be able to catch her food. And so along with our other reptiles who have their own personal reasons for not being able to be released, she sticks around with us. So come out in the springtime when it's nice and warm and you'll be able to see Freya here out on display. One last look at her, especially I like to show off her face 
because falcons are the birds that have the black lines under their eyes. All falcon species will have that, and that kind of goes along with their speed. So they are searching for birds and food so fast that when the sun comes down, instead of ruining their vision, it will actually bounce off of that black line. So that's actually why a lot of uh, athletes will wear black on their faces. It helps keep their vision sharper. And so she's got a lot of different things about her to make her the wonderful bird of prey that she is. But remember I said, you know, she's not gonna be around here in the wintertime. Why don't I bring out a bird that stays here, braves the Ohio winter, and I will be right back with an owl. And if anybody has any questions, go ahead and answer or put those in the Q&A box. Um, Jenny, could I ask you a question while Catherine's getting ready? So we had somebody write in and say that they heard possums feet and tails are susceptible to frostbite. Um, is it plausible to build a shelter for a possum to use in the winter? And what would that shelter look like? I don't know. I think oh. it's a cool idea to build a possum shelter in your yard. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, what I do in my yard, and not everybody can do this because if you lived in the city area, you wouldn't. it wouldn't be accepted. But I, I do a lot of pruning because I have uh, fruit trees. I have peach trees and apple trees. And I a long time ago, before I knew the value of a brush pile, I used to burn my burn my prunings, but now I pile them and I have these wonderful habitats that birds, little bunnies, mice, chipmunks, everything runs to and goes under. And I'm sure that they're warm as well. Um, wood generates heat, so sawdust generates heat, things burrow in those sorts of things to stay warm. So if you had enough space on your property to make a brush pile or something like that with your prunings from your trees, you could try that. I've never seen a possum come out of one yet, but I hope I do someday. <laughs> That's a great idea. Um, and it looks like Catherine is ready. Is this Clyde, Catherine? This is Clyde. He is such <laughs> a crowd pleaser. He likes to show off and he is one of my favorites to bring out to everybody. So you guys, this is Clyde and he is our barred owl. And I'm gonna say that again because a lot of people mishear that. So we do have barn owls. Owls that live, you know, typically think of them in barns, but those are those white owls with a heart-shaped face. He is, has much more color and not so heart-shaped of a face. So this is a barred owl, B-A-R-R-E-D, and he gets that name because of this lovely line pattern that he has on his chest and on his wings. Now, barred owls are a very common owl species in Ohio. They're actually one of the top three most common that you'll see here. And they do, they stay here all winter long. You typically see these guys living in old growth forests, uh, just nice forested land in general. And that's because they are not really nest builders. So they are gonna be cavity nesters. They're gonna find hollowed out spaces and trees and kind of take use of that rather than actually thinking of building something. And now these birds are going to catch their food a little bit differently than our peregrine falcon because uh, they are not that fast. So you think of a peregrine falcon being about 200, our hawks and eagles will reach speeds of about 90, our owl species are about 30. Owls are very slow flyers, but that is okay because they've got a lot of different adaptations to help them with that. So one in particular is obviously everybody knows most owls are nocturnal. So they've got large eyes to help them see at nighttime. Well, in fact, he doesn't actually use his eyes that often. Owls use their hearing more than anything to find their food. Owls ears are not positioned quite like ours. So we've got one on each side, fairly symmetrical, but with owls, if I were able to show you his ears, which I can't, they're buried under feathers. One ear is up here on top of his head and his other ear is right down here below its beak. His ears are complete opposite sides of his face. And what that offsetness does is lets him basically register a sound faster than anything else. And so as soon as he hears that sound, it's registered, he can start flying after it. He's also a fairly silent flyer. Owls can sneak up on their food because on the tips of their feathers, they have a little bristle. 
And this bristly feathered edge, basically when he flaps his wings, that air goes through that bristle, breaks up any sound that that would make and makes him that silent flyer that he is. And then inevitably for his food, it's gonna be some rodents, some small mammals, uh, amphibians and reptiles are great since they're in that damp forested area. And they can even dive into creeks and catch little minnows and salamanders and frogs. But they'll use those sharp talons to grip onto that food, take it back, and they will go ahead and eat it. They're not gonna be birds that you typically see out in the open eating their food. That's unfortunately because there are predators for this guy. You don't wanna stay out in the open when there's something out there wanting to find you for food. So they will go back to that cavity and eat and have their rest. You might see them a little bit more active during the winter months because they need to find more food. So birds are not cold-blooded like our reptiles. Birds are actually warm-blooded like us. And so they have to keep that body temperature up. And so the way they do that is by being a little bit more active, by eating more food. And the other way they keep warm is pretty interesting. And he's doing a great job of showing it off. You'll notice that he's got all these puffy feathers here. What he'll do, and all birds of prey that stay here all year round will do, is they will actually puff up those feathers, allow air to get caught up underneath of those feathers, lay down that top layer. And what those air pockets do is they get stuck. That air gets stuck between the top feathers and their body, and so it starts to warm itself up. That is the same process you think of if you ever have worn a wetsuit or know why you would need a wetsuit. When you go into the water, that creates air pockets next to your body in that suit to help keep you warm. So birds can do it too. I always used to call it like a bird sweater, and then now I call it a wetsuit. Less fun, I feel like. But these are a great bird to get to see. You also are gonna start to see owls a little bit more coming into February and March because it's about time to start laying eggs. So great horned owls are our first nesters and they are going to probably right now start to be getting onto a nest. And when I say getting onto a nest, great horned owls don't build a nest either. They just steal one. They'll find an old hawk nest or something like that and start sitting on it. And after they're out, you know that barred owls will be quickly following. So you might be able to get to see them or hear them. They are a very, uh, if you've heard a barred owl, you know it. They're the ones that have the phrase, who cooks for you, who cooks for you all. Um, and they obviously don't say that. It's more of a, oh, 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 oh. Yeah, Clyde doesn't care. He knows I'm a person. But if you heard that out in the wild, you know you've got a barred owl around. And Clyde will be with us for a really long time because unfortunately, Clyde here, this wing that Draper is down there, is his broken wing. Even though he's had plenty of time to heal, that wing, because bird bones are hollow, not solid like our bones, they break and they break pretty badly. And so he can't really fly with that wing anymore. And that means he gets to stick around with us and come do amazing presentations like this. And hopefully you guys have enjoyed it and have some questions for me. I love absolutely getting to be interactive with you guys. And what questions do you have for Jenny and I? Catherine, I think you guys have done a fabulous job presenting because we don't have any, any more questions at the moment. So if you do have some, please go oh. ahead and enter them in the box. But Jenna, um, she had something to elaborate a bit on the possum question. Are you there, Jenna? I am. Um, okay. The question about uh, kind of like what could you do for possums and the fact that their little feet um, get frostbit and their tails can get frostbit. Um, if you look online, there are plans for, um, they're usually uh, with feral cat groups and any shelter that you um, can make for a feral cat also work for possums which was an, an unexpected benefit of these people who were trying to help these cat colonies. And one of the most common ones is, um, you know, this, the, the plastic containers, you can get them pretty much from any store. People use them for storage bins. You take one of those and flip it over and um, you can cut out um, just an, an opening maybe about this big at the end. And they do this for cats and they usually fill the boxes with straw. Um, but they have found that possums like them as well. And so it's a neat little way. Like Jenny was talking about, I have a brush pile as well. 
and they are fantastic for smaller animals. Um, so that's a really, really good thing to do in your yard for habitat. But if you want to help um, help the possums specifically a little more, since they're a little bigger, um, these uh, storage containers make great little shelters for them. And you can just put them um, around your yard. Like if you've got, um, like, okay, for me, I've got like a wooded patch next to my house. So um, we're actually in the process of making some of these, <laughs> um, my kids and I. Um, so we're going to put them kind of at the edge of the habitat, you know, where the kind of where our yard starts and where the forest, or rather where our yard stops and where the forest starts. And we're going to see if we can help possums because we really like them here in my house. Awesome. And we have a couple questions. I'm going to come back to Catherine because they have to do with owls. Um, but before those questions, I, I just saw that we have Jen who wrote in and she's sharing this with her sixth grade class and she said, what a great resource. So that is so exciting. Thank you, Jen. Um, but Josie, age seven, she asks, why does the owl have such colorful feathers? Oh, that is a wonderful question. So the reason that Clyde has the colors that he has is because of camouflage. So you guys might remember I mentioned that there are predators to this barred owl. So not only does camouflage help with predators, but it also helps him blend in. So when he's trying to get his food, they don't detect him. So that coloration, that brown line, that white color all blends in with our Ohio forests. So if you see a bird that has different colors, that might indicate to you, hmm, where might they live? Because we do sometimes get, so on the flip side of birds migrating out, sometimes we get birds migrating in. This time of year is great to get to see snowy owls, to get to see northern harriers, to get to see um, rough-legged hawks. And those birds are going to have a little bit different color pattern because they are used to being a little farther north. You think of snowy owl, they are, they're almost pure white with brown and black speckles to them. Same thing with our rough legged hawks and our harriers. So that is an excellent question. And that's actually something I always look for when I see something while I'm, you know, maybe in the passenger seat driving, I'm trying to call out what's around me. I always look at what color I'm looking at. Okay, lots of questions about owls. <laughs> um, I'm not I surprised. like owls. Yeah. How many species of owls live in Ohio? Oh, that's one of my favorites to talk about because bats aren't the only thing we have a lot of species of. We have eight species of owls that call Ohio home, whether it's all year round or some time of the year. And eight species is actually a lot. It doesn't sound like a lot, but that is one of the most amount of species, not only in North America, but in the entire world. So if you want to look at owls, Ohio is the place to be. Um, and what are the predators of owls? Actually, two people asked that uh, question, so that's a popular one. Honestly, I probably should have told you when I said predators. I'm sorry, everybody. So when I talk about predators to our owls, we're thinking anything larger than him. So not only will other owls prey on him, but sometimes being in that cavity, they can be in kind of tussles with other cavity nesters. So we mentioned raccoons. They live in a lot of the same places that barred owls too. Who will win in that fight? It just kind of depends. But really the big predator that owls are worried about is those larger owls. So in Ohio here, we do have great horned owls and snowy owls that are larger than barred owls. And that means that they will be predators to the barred owl. On the flip side though, that means barred owls will be predators to anything smaller, like our barn owls and our screech owls and our sawwood owls. Okay, and um, we have one last question that I see here. Uh, not not to do with owls this time, but bats. So I don't know if you want to answer it, Catherine or Jenny, either of you. Um, how long do bats live if they don't get white nose? And is there anything that we can do to keep the bats from getting white nose? That is an excellent question. I bet Jenny and I both can um, reach in on this if that's OK. Um, for me, it's really important for folks um, to one, if they do have that cave area around or near them, to one, sometimes just stay out. It's better to not go into an area, um, and especially in the wintertime when they're snoozing, but just in general. And then two, if you do have to or go into that area, clean yourself off afterwards. Because one of the biggest problems is people taking it on their clothing and transporting it to a new area. Uh, in fact, white nose actually stayed on the eastern part of the country until somebody carried it 
from the eastern part all the way to western uh, western United States. So you see white nose on the west coast and the east coast, nothing in the middle though. Mm. So always make sure you clean off yourself, um, stay out of those areas. And then if bats don't get white nose, they can live actually a pretty long time. In captivity, I think the oldest bat is like 30 something. Uh, and then in the wild, they're gonna have a little bit of a shorter lifespan because their lives are just harder. Um, you know, they're migrating, they're hibernating, they're changing all these different things. There are some things that eat bats out there. So there's just a little bit of a harder lifestyle for them there. So I wanna thank you guys for uh, letting me join in. I would love to hear what Jenny has to say. I think you covered it, Catherine. You covered the question very well. <laughs> um, and with that, you know, we're about out of time. It's 11, so I'll just thank everybody for joining. Please check out our webinars. Um, you can go to our webpage, ohiodnr.gov, and um, go to our virtual programming page and find all of our webinars for the month there or on our Facebook page. They're all listed there as well. Um, and if you missed anything and you want to check it out, uh, uh, want to watch the video back, it will be posted on our YouTube channel. So just go to YouTube and search Ohio DNR. You'll find all of our archived webinars and some awesome short videos on that page. So thanks again and have a great week. Bye.